Hello YouTube. Uh, now, in all the previous videos, we've been talking quite informally about validity and invalidity, but we need to define these notions in more formal terms. Um, in fact, we need to talk quite generally about the concept of logical consequence. Um, uh, I suppose in some ways we're kind of going back to the very, very basics here. Um, logical consequence is one of the most fundamental ideas in uh, in all of logic. Uh, so, uh, what are we dealing with here? Well, let's take a simple argument. Let's say we take a very simple argument such as if pigs can fly, then the moon is made of cheese. Pigs can fly, therefore the moon is made of cheese. Well, obviously, this argument is complete nonsense. Um, but equally obviously, it's got something right. And you'll probably notice that what it's got right is is its form. Uh, it's of the form modus ponens. If p then q, p therefore q. Um, it's quite clear that given these premises, you know, if these premises were true, then the conclusion would follow. Um, you know, the conclusion is a consequence of these premises. Uh, or we might say, we might say the conclusion follows from these premises. Or we might say that it is that it is entailed by our premises, or we might say that from these premises we can infer the conclusion, and so on and so on. There are many ways of phrasing this idea that um, that this conclusion is a consequence of these premises, and that's the case uh, whenever we have a valid argument form. Whenever we have a form of argument that is valid, um, the conclusion is a consequence of the premises, or it follows from the premises. Uh, and that's the idea that I want to draw your attention to, because what what does it mean? What does it mean to say that uh, an argument's conclusion is a consequence of the premises? How does it work? How do we understand the idea of consequence? Um, you know, there are many ways of sort of phrasing this, but uh, do we really know what's going on here? How can it be that the conclusion is a consequence of the premises. So we're going back to the very basic, fundamental idea here, and we're trying to think about how this actually works. Well, um, there are actually many, many ways of uh, dealing with this notion, but there are two in particular that are uh, extremely important in modern logic. So I'm going to talk about those two. The first one is what we call semantic or model theoretic consequence. And this concept, the way of symbolizing it, is with the uh, the double turn style here. Um, and the way that you would read this statement here is that A is a semantic consequence of some set of sentences gamma. So we're just using the, uh, the letter gamma to stand in for any number of you know, arbitrary sentences that we might want to have there. So A is a semantic consequence of gamma. That's how we sort of talk about the notion of semantic consequence. Uh, and this idea is uh, is often attributed to the logician Alfred Tarski, um, although I should note that there's quite a lot of debate about whether he actually came up with it. Um, you know, he was certainly a big influence and you know, but w whether he came up with this idea specifically is uh, is controversial. There's there's a bit of uh, controversy there. So uh, we won't say that he definitely did, but it is often attributed to him, to Alfred Tarski. Uh, anyway, the basic idea here uh, is that if we take some premises and a conclusion, then every interpretation that makes the premises true also makes the conclusion true. So. A is a semantic consequence of gamma. If and only if, every interpretation that makes gamma true also makes A true. Uh, so that is, we're dealing with the, the absence of a counterexample. Remember, a counterexample is an interpretation that makes gamma true, but makes, uh, sorry, an interp a counterexample is an interpretation that makes the premises uh, gamma true, but makes the conclusion A false. That would be a counterexample. So, semantic consequence obtains when every interpretation that makes 
gamma true also makes a true. That is, the, it obtains when there is no counterexample. Um, so let's recall how interpretations and counterexamples work in the case of our system K. Uh, well, in K, uh, as I've dealt with before, we have a model, WRA, uh, where W is the set of worlds, R is the accessibility relation, and A is a function that assigns truth values to propositions within worlds. Mm, so if you look at you know the argument uh, necessarily if P then Q, therefore if necessarily P, then necessarily Q. Well, that's a valid argument. Uh, I think I've looked at this in a previous video, this argument, and we've seen that it's valid. Uh, it, this is just a sort of way of rephrasing the uh, distribution axiom. Um, and so this doesn't have any counterexamples. Uh, there's no way, there's no interpretation on which it, uh, necessarily if P then Q is true, but if necessarily P then necessarily Q is false. So there is no counterexample. So this argument would be considered semantically valid. This conclusion is a semantic consequence of this premise. Um, now, on the other hand, let's take a look at an argument that we uh, that we saw in the last video. So this is um, an argument with no premises, it's just a conclusion. Uh, if possibly P, then necessarily possibly P. Now, as we've seen, there is indeed an interpretation um, in which the, uh, the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Uh, obviously the premises don't actually matter in this case because this is just a conclusion so all we need to do is is show that the conclusion can be uh, can be false um and here it is formally and here it is in diagram form this is just what we went over in the last video uh this this is our counterexample to this argument um and so what we're doing is we're we're simply assigning truth values to the uh propositional variables in accordance with the kind of way of interpreting the system K, you know, in accordance with our possible world semantics. Um, and then we've come up with a way of assigning these these truth values that make this false. So we have a counterexample. Um, now, I mean, I hope that that's sort of, sort of simple, uh, but you might be kind of thinking that this is a bit, this is all a bit uh, basic, I suppose. You know, we've kind of been over all of this sort of stuff before, it's maybe kind of obvious. Well, let's contrast this notion of semantic consequence with uh, another another approach. So the other approach that's very important is syntactic or proof theoretic consequence. And this is symbolized gamma turnstile A, and that's read uh, A is a semantic consequence of the set of sentences gamma. Um, now, this is often traced to a mathematician called uh, Gerhard Gensen. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. That's what it looks like to me, Gerhard Gensen. Uh, anyway, th this idea is, I think, quite a bit simpler or a bit more intuitive. Um, so the idea here is that a conclusion is a syntactic consequence of the premises, just in case you can arrive at the conclusion by the application of uh, uh, allowable inference rules. So um, A is a syntactic consequence of gamma, if and only if A can be derived from gamma by the application of uh, particular formal rules. Now, in our case, we've been using truth trees. Uh, so in our case, we would say that a conclusion is a syntactic consequence of the premises if we can assume its negation apply our inference rules and then close the tree. Um, there are obviously uh, methods other than truth trees, so we'll just say that syntactic consequence obtains when our inference rules allow us to derive the conclusion. The, the point here that we're focusing on is the rules, the inference rules. That's, that's what we're kind of honing in on here. So um, let's look at the argument we did last time, okay, from the last slide. Possibly P, then necessarily possibly P. Well, uh, our um, counterexample uh, represents the semantic approach. So that's when we have, that's when we sort of define our set of worlds, we define the accessibility relation, and then we had a function that assigned truth values to our propositional variables. Um, 
Now that was the semantic approach. This truth tree here, this represents the syntactic approach. Um, so what's, what's going on here? Well, this is just, this here is just a formal procedure. We, uh, you know, all, all we're doing here is simply stipulating that if you see this string of symbols, say, uh, which we're calling a, a false conditional, so if you see this string of symbols, um, you know, of the form uh, not if x then y, then you can, then you can write, if you see that, then you can write x and not y. Um, so let's just let's try to put this in terms that are sort of purely formal. Um, if you see a string of symbols of the form tilde bracket x arrow y, where x and y sort of stand in for any uh, other well-formed formulas, then you can write uh, then you can write the part before the arrow, and then you can write uh, the part after the arrow with a tilde in front of it. So similarly, if you see this diamond. Then you draw a new arrow to a new world, and so on and so forth. Um, all we're all we're doing here is manipulating these symbols using certain rules that we've stipulated, um, and uh, we're saying you know you can take some string of symbols, manipulate those string of symbols, and arrive at another string of symbols. Uh, so validity is simply defined in terms of this formal procedure, this kind of symbol manipulation, this application of formal rules. Um, so here, with our argument that's valid, all we're saying is, if you take this string of symbols and you then apply to this string of symbols allowable rules, you will arrive at this string of symbols, or you can arrive at this string of symbols. That's the basic idea of syntactic consequence. It's purely formal. We're pu dealing purely with symbol manipulation. Now, uh, naturally, uh, different logics will require different models and different inference rules. So uh, in the system K, we have possible worlds, uh, and we have truth trees where we open up new worlds and all that stuff. But obviously in propositional logic, that doesn't happen. Uh, so there are many different logics out there, there are many different kinds of models, many different kinds of inference rules. But um, the, the notions of semantic and syntactic consequence are transferable. So with semantic consequence, uh, that deals with absence of counterexamples. With syntactic consequence, that focuses just on the formal procedures. And of course you can, you can change how the counterexamples work, you can change how the formal uh, procedures work. So what we usually do, because we end up then having all different kinds of semantic and syntactic consequences, uh, what we usually do is um, put the name of the logic that we're considering in subscript next to our consequence symbols. So uh, if we have some set gamma of premises followed by double turn style k, then some conclusion a, what this means is that in the system K, this conclusion is a semantic consequence of this set of premises. Uh, so there's no interpretation of K that makes the premises true and makes the conclusion false. Uh, gamma turns style K, then some conclusion A, means that in the system K, this conclusion is a syntactic consequence of the set of premises. So that is by applying the inference rules of K to these sentences, we can derive this conclusion. Um, uh, so you might, you, you, we're going to be seeing that quite a lot, but you might also see, for example, um, uh, gamma double turn style PLA, and this means that in propositional logic, uh, A is a semantic consequence of the set gamma. In propositional logic, A is a syntactic consequence of gamma. So we can use these symbols for all different logics, um, but we usually put the name of the logic in subscript next to it, so we know which one we're talking about. Uh, although sometimes you just admit, uh, omit it for convenience. Uh, so some other things that you might see are uh, double turn style A or turn style A without any set of sentences, so there's nothing before it. And of course this just refers to arguments with no premises, to uh, tautologies.
actually gamma can you know still be used in those cases if you include the empty set as part of gamma. Uh, so things like um, you know if necessarily if p then q then necessarily p and if necessarily p then necessarily q. Well, we can just we can write that without any sentences on the on the left side because that's just a tautology that can be derived outside any premises. Um, and we also then have the double turnstile and the turnstile with a strike through. And these simply mean that A is not a semantic consequence of gamma uh, and A is not a semant uh, syntactic consequence of the set gamma. So I think that that's you know, completely uh, intuitive, completely sensible, nothing too difficult there. Uh, now, I should just say, I should say uh, that most logicians consider semantic consequence to be the most fundamental kind of consequence. Um, that is, most logicians would tend to tie validity to semantic consequence rather than syntactic consequence. Um, the reason is that with syntactic consequence, you're simply dealing with inference rules. But of course, you can come up with whatever inference rules you like. So you could say, "Have this is an inference rule." You could have, you could say, as an inference rule, if you see not p, then write p, then derive p. I mean, we could do that, uh, but uh, of course, it would be a fairly useless system and would bear no relation to how. Uh, you know, validity actually works. So uh, what we have to do is check that our inference rules actually capture consequence in an acceptable way. Uh, this would not be acceptable um, in to, to the vast majority of people at least. Um, and this is why most logicians consider the semantic approach to, uh, to be the sort of most fundamental kind. Um, but it is worth pointing out that the nature of logical consequence remains a very deeply controversial area and I'm going to explore it a bit more in a supplementary video. But in this series proper I'm just going to follow the convention. So um, we will define validity in relation to semantic consequence. We will say that uh, gamma double turn style K A uh, means that the, the argument gamma uh, therefore A is k valid, um, and of course, gamma uh, double turnstile strike through would mean that it's invalid. Um, so we're we're tying validity to semantic consequence, uh, which of course means that an argument is valid only if it has no interpretation that makes the premises true and the conclusion false. That is only if it has no counterexample. Um, so we could, of course, tie it, if we were to tie it to syntactic consequence instead, if we were to say that syntactic consequence is what's required for validity, then we wouldn't actually need to bother with counterexamples or anything like that. We could just use the truth trees and that would be enough. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the convention is to sort of say, no, we need some way of independently checking that truth trees actually work. And I think that even intuitively, there's a sense that we kind of need to do that. Um, right, that's all for uh, this video. Uh, I'll look at some other stuff next time. We'll talk about soundness and completeness um, next time, I think, because they're related to these ideas. But keep this in mind. Uh, keep in mind the distinction that we've had. It's a very, very important distinction. I know that it is uh, quite abstract, perhaps, but it is very important, so you will need to bear it in mind. Syntactic con uh, semantic consequence, semantic consequence, the double turn style deals with counterexamples and interpretations and all that stuff. Syntactic consequence deals with purely formal procedures. And uh, I'll see you next time. Goodbye.